Uh, okay, so this is a postmortem on my recent release Neophyte on Itch. My name is Max. Uh, I go by Regal Pigeon on Twitter and Discord and everywhere else. Yeah, so who am I? I I'm a solo game dev with a full-time job, a 9-to-5 sort of thing. Uh, I make stuff in Game Maker. You know, before Neophyte, I've made like five or six small prototypes, and I had a semi-abandoned project called Bombhead, which I was working on for about two plus years on and off. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a bit, a little bit about that. First, yeah, so this is what Neophyte looks like. I hope the video quality is okay. But Neophyte is a mini Diablo 3 sort of ARPG inspired roguelite with a, a focus on sort of creating builds out of spells, passives, and stat bonuses that you gain throughout the run. Okay, and yeah, so the results. Uh, it took me three months start to, uh, to finish which I was very happy with because, you know, I, my previous project, I kind of meandered about for about two, two plus years. So it was good to actually finally finish something. And yeah, it was, it was my first finished project. And I decided to knock out my finished project and paid release all in one go. Uh, so I just released it for $1, which is, you know, not much. But I felt like I think I read somewhere. I can't remember where I read it, but somebody said that it's just quite important to get past that mental barrier of like selling something so that's what i decided to do with this it got a little bit of coverage from uh retromation which if you don't know is a, a youtuber who's very focused on sort of roguelike games uh, so my game was like something that kind of fit with what his audience sort of expects and then there was a smaller youtuber recently uh, olexa who also does roguelike coverage who made a video and most recently, Spadercat Gaming, which was the biggest YouTuber so far who's covered it. Yeah, and I might go into this a bit later, but that had a huge impact on, well, I say huge, relatively huge impact on sales. So it was featured by Itch, and it was the top seller. I think I, I checked today, and it is the top seller again after the Splattercat Gaming video. And I can only imagine that top sellers on Itch is based on units sold, not gross revenue, because I sold mine at a $1 price tag. And it's made... 4,500 US dollars plus in gross revenue in 45 days from itch alone. I'm aiming for a Steam release at some point, probably in the next few months, and hopefully that'll sort of give me another boost in sales. But you know, I'm, I'm not really like looking to like transition into a full-time career anytime soon in game dev, so it's just nice to sort of make some money on the side. So yeah, my first project was called Bombhead, and this was the trailer that I made for it to coincide with the release of like a free playable demo to get some feedback. And Bombhead is a top-down roguelite or roguelite where you throw, catch, and bounce your explosive head to sort of power it up and defeat enemies. Uh, the basic game mechanic is that you bounce and catch your uh, head to level, up, level it up and um, the bomb needs to be of equal or greater power to an enemy's toughness in order to damage it. Uh, most enemies are destroyed in one blast, and, and the power and toughness is all um, shown by their color. So yellow is level 1, blue is level 2, red is level 3. And I plan to have three levels in a final boss, but I only managed to finish two levels. Okay, so why didn't I finish Bombhead? One thing is I didn't have a clear vision going into it. Yeah, all I knew going into it was that I wanted to make a top-down action roguelike in the vein of... I was really inspired by Enter the Gungeon, which I played a lot of. And I wanted to do something with a similar structure, but with a sort of unique combat mechanic. Uh, I didn't want sort of standard shooting or melee combat, which aren't bad things. It's just I, I just wanted to do something different. This led to a, a problem where I actually have a hard time describing what the game is, because I sort of developed the mechanics as I went along. And yeah, to this day, I still have trouble sort of explaining exactly what you do. I feel like it's easy-ish to understand once you played it for a little bit. But yeah, I just find it difficult to explain the core mechanics. Uh, another issue is that I had a very poor concept of scope as I only made five or six prototypes before doing this sort of larger project. And those prototypes were basically, you know, you have some enemies in a room, you defeat them, and then you close the game and restart it. There was no sort of level progression, no, no menus, no audio even. So I really didn't have a good understanding on how long those other systems can take, yeah, and, and how it can be a sort of challenge to fit them in uh, to your game in a way that makes it uh, expandable. And yeah, I also invited a bit of outside pressure early on 
uh, too early, I think, for a, for a first project. I don't think I should have done that. And, and, and what I mean by that is I hired a composer to do the music on a sort of, you know, I forgot exactly how much I paid, but it was an upfront cost and then uh, a revenue share agreement. I think that just made it more difficult to finish just having that outside pressure uh, when I wasn't confident in my ability to finish games. And um, the composers were lovely. They they never hounded me. Every, like, you know, couple of months, they would ask me politely, you know, where I'm at and if I had, uh, when I'm ready to show them something so that they can make a new track for, you know, the third level, you know, I can feel free to send it along. And yeah, I just, I never finished it. Uh, another problem I had was that I was constantly redesigning the game, both visually and mechanically, as you can see here. Uh, it's gone through many, in fact, I don't think this is showing all of the visual overhauls. I think there were one or two more, but yeah, I think over a certain amount of time, um, once you spent like sort of years on a game, you get to a point where like, I feel like my ability to make art has improved. So I should overhaul all the existing assets, which takes a lot of time and sets you back and yeah, it, it, it can be a sort of uh, deadly cycle. I think it's important to just finish it and save, you know, whatever skills you've accrued for your next project. There are also a lot of design decisions that I kept on going back and forward on. I think that goes back to sort of not having a clear vision on what I wanted from the game. So one example is like level progression. I didn't know if I wanted... I, I, it originally started as like a Binding of Isaac sort of dungeon crawler. You go from room to room in a randomly generated level. Uh, and then I did like a Slay the Spire style map where you, you know, a bunch of nodes that you progress through and you can like sort of choose your path through those. And I eventually landed on just like a linear path. Like there are combat rooms and they're handmade and they're chosen randomly. And you just, you go through them and you, I think it was like, you know, 10 rooms per level or something like that, which was what I should have done in the first place. It was just the, you know, the main draw of the game was the unique combat mechanic. So I didn't, uh, I don't think I should have wasted a lot of time being indecisive on the um, on on the other systems like like level progression, I think something uh, simple would have been fine. Yeah, I also spent too much time polishing the wrong things. I could spend like hours or days just you know fiddling with like menu buttons, making them like bouncy and doing smooth screen transitions, and they have nothing to do with the core game loop. So that was just I think that was time that I could have spent elsewhere. I also spent way too long developing the game before getting feedback. Uh, I released my playable demo, I think like one and a half years, if not longer, after I started. And yeah, by then, yeah, I, I feel like A, I was like too invested in the game and B, I had already made like a lot of design decisions that it turned out people were not super happy with. So it felt like, again, a lot, a lot of time wasted, a, a lot of um, things I could have corrected had I gotten feedback earlier. And so what was different with Neophyte? So a big thing was having a set deadline. I made the game, I decided to make the game in three months as part of uh, Johnson's new project, quarterly made game, where every quarter a group of local devs try to make a game. And yeah, we, we all present them at the end. And it's just nice to have a sort of shared environment where everybody is working with a shared deadline, uh, even if there's really not much pressure at all. Like, you know, we don't hound each other for content or, or you know, to, we, we don't have like set dates where we have to share everything. We can just share what we want uh, as we go. And I really like that environment. It really helped me. And this also gave me a enough time to sort of make what I wanted, like replayable game, which kind of like uh, contrasts to uh, like game jam sort of scope where, you know, it, it typically it's a couple of days where it can end up being very stressful, at least I find. And in my experience, it doesn't really make, it doesn't really give you enough time to make something that I would want to play. You know, certain genres I, I, I think are impossible or at least very difficult within a two to three day time limit. So it was good to have enough time to make uh, something that I would want to play myself. I, okay, and this uh, sandwich development that I said, I'm sure there's a proper term for it. You know, I didn't really have any education in uh, development or programming or anything. So, so that's what I'm calling it. And what I mean by that is uh, I completed the uh, core gameplay loop. So all the spells and passives and all that sort of stuff. I made sure I had like a sort of vertical slice on like the core gameplay loop, I guess. And then once that was done, so I had like, you know, a few enemies, a few spells, all the systems in place to like 
swap spells, gain spells, equip items, all that sort of stuff. Once I had all that done, I went through and I was like, okay, right, I'm going to knock out the menu system, I'm going to knock out the audio, uh, I'm going to knock out like the intro screen, the death screen, the victory screen, basically everything that you know a full game release kind of should have in order to feel like a finished project. And the benefit of that is that once you're done with all of that, you can spend all your remaining time sort of just fleshing out the content that adds to uh, adds to gameplay. So I spent the rest of that time designing enemies and designing spells, making art assets and all that stuff. And then by the end of it, no matter where you're at, you'll have something to release because you have a menu, you, you have everything you need in order for players to, to play it from start to finish, uh, even if the content is lacking. Yeah, and I also focused a lot on um, things that supported the core gameplay loop and provided the most variety. So again, you know, I, I focused a lot of my efforts on designing the spells, emblems, tomes, and enemies, as opposed to other systems that, um, you know, like making cool menus and intros and, and making a really polished death and victory screen. I spent very little time on those uh, and focused on what I felt was important, which might be an obvious thing to say, but uh, I don't know if anybody else has that problem, but I can spend way too long on very minute details that don't have anything to do with actual gameplay. Yeah, and another important thing to do is to reuse and tweak uh, previously made assets and code. So these are some of the things that I reused from, uh, a lot of them from Bombhead, but also from other projects, prototypes that I've done. Uh, I do, all my games so far have just so happen to be like top down and pixel art and they all kind of happen to be the same sort of resolution because i found that the the character size that i went with allowed me to give enough details to the uh to the sprites without uh having to be too much work to animate so because of that i just sort of happened to have a mini library of effects and stuff that i could use and that i could pretty much implement straight into the game with like very minimal uh tweaking so yeah, I ported my camera system straight from Bombhead, all the animation systems, depth sorting, shadows, collisions, all that stuff, which can be quite tricky uh, in a top-down game. Like, I had a lot of that ready to go, um, which was very useful. And in the future, yeah, I think anytime I'm going to do like a top-down game, I'm going to be reusing a lot of this stuff. Uh, yeah, and it's also important to scope your assets appropriately. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, I personally find that art and animation are the most time-consuming parts of game development. Uh, I, d I can just spend like hours and hours on sprite work and animation. So for this project, I decided to try and keep that to a minimum. So I tried to add as much like code-based animation in order to sort of add juice and life to, uh, to everything. You know, I, I use things like sprite squashing and stretching and sprite shaking and little like simple shaders like making sprites flash white or red when they're hit or damaged and that sort of thing right to sort of sell effects without having to spend too much time on um uh, on making like uh, handmade sprites and i also decided not to make any idle or walk animations or cycles or enemy death animations these are pretty time consuming when you have to do them for every single like enemy type and in this game, at least, you're not really standing still for very long. Uh, and if you are, it's like a you're doing like a spell cast animation. So I just decided, you know, I'm not going to have any idle animations. And that's something I messed up with in Bombhead was that everything had an idle and a walk animation. And it just feels like if you do that for one asset, then you have to do that for all the rest. Yeah, that's, at least that's what it felt like to me. Because I was thinking more about scope and how long it would take and how much time I had. Uh, to finish this game, I prioritized most of my efforts on the things that most significantly impacted game feel. So things like spell cast animations and spell effects, uh, the flashy stuff that the player gets to do. And um, yeah, even though I, I didn't spend too much time making art assets in this game, I found that like a lot of the comments, a lot of the feedback, they said that you know the character felt quite alive and the, the effects were, they felt good and everything. So I was very happy with that. Uh, very happy with like how much you can get if you just sort of add little like sort of code based um, effects to the game. Yeah, and another thing, uh, I'll put this in quotations, but like efficient enemy design. And this is something that sounds obvious, but I went into this trying to make sure that every enemy sort of served a specific gameplay purpose. In Neophyte, there are only seven 
enemy types right now. I'm planning to add a few more as the game goes on, but um, that's how many are in the game as of like the 1.0 release. And I added them, I made sure all of them had a purpose and tried to think about how each enemy type would sort of change how the player prioritizes who to focus on. So you have like your sort of standard skeleton enemies, which are basically fodder and they feel in a sort of Diablo fashion, like they feel really good to just just completely mow through. But if you leave them on their own, if you don't deal with them and they build up and they get close to you, they can still present a threat. And then you have the Beholder, which is the flying Cyclops sort of guy. And that enemy has a a powerful long range beam attack and importantly has a fixed uh, turn rate, which makes it so that it's actually easier to outrun the beam if the player is closer, which is important because as much as possible, I want to try to avoid, you know, it's always advantageous in these sort of games to sort of run away, uh, continuously run away from enemies and kite them. And that is still an issue in my game. That is still like a dominant strategy. But the Beholder is like one way of sort of trying to mitigate that and trying to uh, encourage the player to be a bit closer. Okay. And yeah, so like, even if it's just fodder, uh, I feel like enemies should have a purpose. This is something, again, which I didn't do in Bombhead. I just sort of was in the habit of thinking of like a cool looking enemy design. And then, you know, sometimes I would like draw a sprite of what I thought would look cool and then design the mechanics based on that sprite rather than the other way around. And a lot of times it wouldn't change anything in, in terms of like how the player approaches the game. Like they would approach that enemy the same as if they were approaching like a completely different enemy so it was just a completely redundant yeah a completely redundant enemy so yeah just keeping in mind how the player will react to the enemies you're designing i think is um very important in order not to waste time yeah okay and i guess we'll get into questions after this but like some just a few final thoughts that having a deadline can be really good for your motivation and forces you to scope appropriately I'm going to continue with that. I'm really liking this quarterly made games thing where you make a game every three months. I'm putting that on hold now because I want to focus on getting Neophyte on Steam and sort of fleshing out the content because that, the most of the feedback I get is that it needs more stuff in it, like more spells and all of that. So I think I'm going to focus on that for now. And also, I think it's important to finish a game and sort of breaking that mental barrier of, yeah, finishing it and, and also selling your game. I feel like once I put it out there it felt like such a load had been lifted uh off of me and yeah I, I just feel like going forward finishing games will be a lot easier than it has been in the past and also finally it seems like there's a growing market for games that are sort of small replayable experiences if you think about things like vampire survivor and snake rx that have been doing really well i think like some of the comments i got on my game were you know, people would say, oh, this is a nice little game to play in between, like, League of Legends or in between, like, Final Fantasy. And, like, I'm completely okay with that. Uh, I kind of like that idea of having, like, making a little game that people can play in between other games. Yeah, and that's my talk. Thanks for listening. I'm not much of a public speaker, so thanks for uh, thanks for bearing with me. Um, the first question is, earlier you brought on the point about having a price point to your game. Was there any reason behind the $1? Like, why not $2 or $5? Yeah, so I, I really just did that because I, I I had no... I think it's hard to think about what your game is worth, especially if it's, like, a very small experience. You know, you can be on some spaces on, like, Twitter or something where people are, like... I think that was a slogan, like, I want worse games, worse, like, shorter games with, like, worse ga- graphics or something, and I want to pay more for them. Yes, I'm serious. There was, like, that thing. Like, there's, like, a copy paste that people copy and pasted. And, like, that's great, but I don't know how many people actually think that. So my rationale was, like, I just want to sell it. That's the only thing. So I'll just put it on for, like, the, the smallest amount, which in my, in my mind was, like, a dollar. So that's the only reason I did that. In retrospect, I think I could have released it for, like, Two or maybe three dollars. Three dollars at a maximum in its current state, I think. But yeah, I really didn't put too much thought into it. Um, like I said, it was a sort of mental barrier that I needed to get through, and that was the most important thing to me. Understandable. And just as you mentioned that you're working on the Steam version now, do you think you would change the price point? Uh, yeah, I will change it likely to, depending on how much content I have by the time I put it on Steam. I will change it to no more than $5. It'll probably be $3. And 
I don't know if this was smart, but I kind of already promised to uh, give a Steam key to everybody who already purchased it on Itch for a dollar, which is fine, like, you know, so I'll, I'll, I will definitely do that. Yeah, so everyone who's already bought it won't have to pay, like, the extra whatever, two dollars or so. Yeah, and why don't we touch on this question from Sky, which was also brought up in the questionnaire, which is, how much marketing do you do? <laughs> Uh, not much. I think I'm not uh, alone in, I, I don't like marketing so much. It's probably like my least favorite aspect of being a solo game developer and all that. Uh, I think that's pretty common. I had built up like, I think now I'm at, what am I at now? Like 3000 something followers on Twitter, which isn't huge by any means, but like it's, you know, it's a sizable little um, follower base. And, you know, the, the, I think like I had about a close to 2000, like as I was coming to the end of my bomb head sort of experiment. And yeah, the only, basically the only marketing I do is like, I post stuff on Twitter every now and then I post something on Reddit, but it like never gets that much traction except in the game maker specific subreddit. And, um, yeah, so I really don't do that much marketing at all. Uh, Retromation, the Retromation video was the, the, uh, thing that like caused the biggest spike in sales and I, I'm pretty sure without that uh, the other YouTubers uh, wouldn't have picked it up uh, and that was just by luck yeah I think he had liked a couple of my previous posts before but he didn't follow me until uh, I, until I released Neophyte yeah so uh, that, sorry that was a bit long winded but I basically the only marketing I do is I post stuff on Twitter every now and then no, yeah, and you know, it's interesting now that we have Splattercat Gaming who has covered Neophyte, you know, it seems like more and more potentially more and more people will cover it. And that has sort of brought Neophyte to Yeah, I yeah. think oh sorry. Yeah, yeah, well just to like um bring the full question um in, you know, since then Neophyte's been a top seller on itch.io for a month. How has that translated into sales and revenue? Uh, yeah, well, it, it had a huge uh, impact. I'm just sort of, I'm on my phone right now. I'm, uh, I'm trying to see if I can get specific numbers. But from what I recall, before the Retromation video, I think I was getting like 10 sales a day. And then after the Retromation video, I was getting like one to 200 a day. And I was kind of surprised at how, like, again, that's not huge, but it is a big increase from the um, original, like, you know, 10 ish sales I was getting per day and I was really surprised with how long that that tail sort of lasted I, I kind of thought oh, okay there I'm, I'm getting like one or two hundred sales uh for the past two days like that's cool and I just assumed it would taper out very quickly but it lasted like a good few weeks and it was it was, it was just dying down when Splattercat uploaded his video and then it, again it shot back up from like it was, it was going down to about like 50 sales a day. And then it shot back up to like, uh, I think it was like 400 sales on the day that he released it, uh, released that video. And then like 350 the next day. And like, yeah, it, it's still going. Um, I do think that the Spadacat video, despite the fact that he has more followers, sorry, more subscribers, I think he has like 700,000 and Retromation only had 150. Um, the... I've just noticed by comparing the views on the Neophyte video on his on Spadacat's channel to like his recent videos, it's it's not really engaging that well with his audience. Like it's it's doing okay, but it's definitely on the lower end. Whereas with the Retromation one, it was, I think even now it's like one of the higher, uh, one of the most viewed videos he's had in like um, over a month or something like that, which was very you know, obviously like I was super happy when I saw that. So yeah, uh, to you know, put a put it as a bullet point. Um, bit like ninety percent of my sales came from those YouTube videos. Actually, it it does say here though, like like. So I think that those those videos were really important for getting me to like the top sellers page. And I think when you're on the top sellers page or the featured page, I think that that gives your game like a lot of visibility because if I'm looking at uh, the referral uh, analytics. I get I got like nine thousand three hundred from itch.io, uh, nine thousand three hundred referrals, and um, six thousand eight hundred from YouTube, right? So itch itch has given me more re referrals, but I don't know if I would have gotten that many had those videos not come out and put me onto the top sellers. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to hear how 
a YouTube video can really impact the sales and visibility of your game on a store, even on itch. Now yeah, to... I, I think it's kind mm -hmm. of cyclical. Uh, sorry, yeah, I just wanted one final thing. I think it's kind of cyclical. Like, I think you need that, like, that bit of a break, right? I think one YouTube video, like one one YouTuber covering it can lead to like other YouTubers covering it. And like I said, if uh, if it gets your game to like the featured page or the top top sellers page, I think that also means that more people on itch who are just like browsing itch will see it and they might buy your game. And yeah, it's the sort of, uh, it's sort of like an exponential growth sort of thing, I think, even yeah. if it's on a relatively small scale. Absolutely. And to jump on another question from Sky was, you know, going back to the development process, how much of the art was you learned beforehand or self-taught and how long were you spending at it? Um, yeah, so hold on. I'm just going to go back because, yeah, okay. So like you can see the top two, that's when I first started. And I, that was around about like 2016, I want to say. I haven't been using Game Maker like, all the time like that between then and now there were periods where like i spent what like uh, there were like months and months or even like a, i think i took like a break for like a year um so it was very on and off until about i'd say like 2019 was when i started doing like more regular it was it's still a hobby right but i was still doing like more regular work on game maker where i was pretty much using it every day and I, I didn't know anything about pixel art before I started using Game Maker, but I used to want to be an illustrator. So I think that that helps a little bit. Uh, but yeah, as you can see, like from those top two prototypes, I really don't think they, they don't look very good at all. Uh, the ones below it were made in like 2019, I think. Yeah. So like that's like a three year gap. And yeah, it's, I think like drawing, uh, you, um, what was I going to say? Like drawing, you, you sort of have to figure out your style. And I, I kind of assume that I'd be able to translate a lot of like my style from like, pa like pen and paper drawing over to pixel art. And that really wasn't the case. They're so different. So yeah, I, I think I answered the question. I actually kind of forgot the question halfway through answering that. I think it answered the question quite well, you know, and to move on a bit with development talk. You know, how much of the design, how much of the concept of Neophyte came into your head? Was it something you sort of improve or thought of it slowly by testing and playing? Or was it something you had everything in mind and you just sort of made it? Um, I, yeah, that's a good question. I originally, like, I had all the, like, the control system, like, how I wanted the player to interact with the game, all the spells and, like, the kind of, um, the way, uh, the way that you play the game. I had all of that mapped out beforehand and that didn't change very much at all uh during the course of development um and part of that was because i was really i really leaned on like diablo 3 even though my game doesn't look anything like diablo 3 in terms of, like art style or tone or anything i just wanted that sort of like power fantasy mixed in with like you know you, there are also like some uh yeah like hordes and hordes of monsters most of which are like fodder but some of which are like uh quite dangerous that sort of thing but there were a few the main uh, design, um, the main thing I struggled with with design was like how to implement passive effects into the game. So like with Diablo, they have an item system, right? With like, and items have like legendary effects, which are basically like sort of, you can kind of think of them as like um, passives in most roguelikes, right? Or items in most roguelikes. And I originally tried to do that. So like, uh, I think you guys will remember if you're on the QMG Discord, like I showed off like a little inventory system and I had like an item system where they could, they had a drop rate for different legend, uh, for different rarities and stuff. Um, but as I was doing that, I figured that like, it seemed like an unnecessary complication. So I decided to pivot and just simplify. And it took like a few iterations of simplifying before I just went, oh, I'm just going to have like a, a simple passive system where you just, you know, you're presented a choice of passives every so often and you just choose one um, before I had like resources that you need to equip them sort of like Hollow Knight in the charm system right you had like a set number of points and each passive had like a, a point cost in order to equip it equip it and you would equip and unequip passives and I just found that a bit too complicated and also it's sort of like you would get like a cool new passive 
but you wouldn't be able to use it because you didn't have enough points yet to equip it and that didn't feel very good so I just decided to simplify so yeah I, I had most of it mapped out in my head yeah because I was I was using Diablo 3 as like a big inspiration for like uh, the core gameplay loop yeah and earlier you also talked about how you designed enemies and having them have a single focus whether it's a single mechanic or trying to get the, um, the player to do something you know how do you balance the game in terms of like health and ability and damage was hmm. it something more you played and played and just or did you have some sort of scale in mind you know what was your process for that it all trial and error like i really wish that there was a, a way and i probably there might be right but i wish there was a way to sort of mathematically uh figure it out um, and it's something that I'm still dialing in. Uh, I think right now most people are saying that it's too easy. Uh, yeah, most people are saying the game is too easy, even with like the challenge, little challenge mode that I added in shortly after release. Yeah, especially since, you know, it, I think it's it's hard when like the player is also scaling in power as they go on, and they're scaling in a way that is inconsistent. Like nothing is perfectly balanced, right? So like, the passives that you get and the spells that you get some are more powerful than others so it's hard to balance when there are a lot of variables like that and that's something that i want to get uh that i want to get better at um but for now I'd, i can't think of any other way than to just do sort of trial and error and um, go by instinct and feel yeah but thank you once again max for spending the time to do a presentation yeah no worries oh uh just one more thing like one more piece of advice like if if a if a, a content creator like likes your work, um, like with Retromation, um, you should like send them a little message on Twitter. Like I sent him a little message saying, "Hey, you know, it meant a lot to me that you made this video and blah blah blah." And he said, "Yeah, um, no worries, it's a cool game." And he he asked me to like keep him updated um, with like any future projects I might have, and uh, if I, you know, decide to update uh, when I update Neophyte, he wants me to keep him in the loop. And I think having that sort of direct pipeline to a to a content creator is a really useful thing to have. So yeah, that's something that I would advise you to do. Absolutely. People pay money for that pipeline, if anything. Exactly. But yeah, thank you once again. And then we'll see you all next time. Yeah, thanks for having me.